I thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge shall flow freely today, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Father God, I pray less of me and more of you, none of me and all of you. Think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords exactly the things that you'd have me to say to these, your sheep. I thank you, Father, that you've anointed them with ears to hear, hearts to receive, and a spirit to contain your word. It's in the holy, mighty, all-knowing, all-powerful name of Jesus, the anointed one, and the power of his anointing that I pray. And let all that agree shout amen. amen. Shout amen again. Amen. Give God one more hand clap of praise, and you may be seated. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Man, I'm excited about the word today. You know why I'm excited about the word? God wants us to win. Amen. God wants us to win. God wants us victorious in everything that we do. You know, I was listening to the song. You know, we got to be careful with some of these Christian songs that we sing because they're written by Christians that don't have faith. They're not necessarily written by Christians that don't have faith. They're just written by Christians that are looking to pull on your on your heartstrings. I don't want the money, the clothes, or the cars. No, I want the money, the clothes, and the cars. I got on two thousand dollar designer shoes. What you mean? I don't want. To, I don't want the money. Dietrich Hatton singing that song with millions in the bank, but he don't want the money, the clothes. He's just trying to get you to to think that you should be broke. God didn't call us to be broke. God called us to prosper. The Bible says we're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. The Bible says we're more than conquerors. That we're overcomers. The Bible says wealth and riches are in our house. How are we supposed to be broke? Now what God doesn't want is he doesn't want the clothes, the cars, and the houses to be the center of our affection. He doesn't want money to have us. He wants us to have money. And he wants us to have money with a mission. What's the mission of money? That his kingdom, his love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness power can be spread into the earth. And we can kill religion. That's what we need to do. We need to, see, we, see, we, we think that we're, as Christians, we think we're fighting the enemy. We're not fighting the enemy. We're not fighting the devil. The devil's defeated. The devil got his behind whooped over 2,000 years ago. We're not fighting the devil. Jesus went down there, knocked on the door, and pulled the devil out the house and whooped his butt up and down Devil Street. Amen? See, what's wrong with some of y'all? Some of y'all ain't never gave nobody a good butt whooping. I had a guy one time, when I, I, I tell you all this before, when I was fighting, I was in Jacksonville, and I'll never forget it. I had on powder blue shorts, and the guy literally in the middle of the ring, when we were getting ready, touched my shorts, he said, baby blue, you must be soft. I'll never forget it. I hit this joker with a right hand, and as he was going down, I caught him, and I stood him up. Now, get up. Get up. I got some more for you. That's how we need to do the devil. You need to stop thinking the devil has power, has authority. The devil's getting to you. The devil can't do nothing to you. You know what's got you? Traditional religion. Religious believing that you're not worthy. Religious believing that you're not good enough. Religious believing that you, you shouldn't be in the house of the Lord. You was in the club last night. We came to save the folks that are in the club. What's wrong with the club? Amen? If we're going to sit in the church, how are we going to save the lost if the lost are in the club? See, some of y'all can't get, go to the club no more because if the minute you step in the club, even though you say you're saved, you're going to be right back in the club. Man, God gave me a word this morning for, you know, on, on the first, I'm going to begin a new sermon series. And I don't know the exact name of it, but the, but the, 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 the gist of it is this. Are you saved or are you sold out? And man, God gave me a word about it this morning when I was studying, man. It was good. And it was something Phil Driscoll taught us a long time ago about music. Phil Driscoll, man, he plays the horn. Phil Driscoll said, when I'm ministering, 
I don't play the horn. I am the horn. That's what God wants us to become. Hey, the word say he we're trying to man we, we we are the word we're the word walking we're the word acting we're the word conquering we're the word defeating we're the word overcoming now today what we're going to talk about is this word it doesn't happen overnight it's a process so we're looking at Joseph remember the Lord the Lord gave me a prophetic word for the church in the new year and I want to read it again for y'all today I said I was going to learn, a, I got to start learning how to watch the clock because, you know, we're going on TV. Give God some praise. Amen. 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 We'll be on TV starting March 1st, so I got to start learning how to adjust my sermon. But you know what? I'm not adjusting very much because it ain't me. It's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you can't put the Holy Spirit on a clock. Amen? Amen. So Jeremiah's going to have to figure it out. <laughs> I got this thing here, 15 minutes, 15. No, I ain't doing that. I just thought about it, man. They can figure it out, right, John? So God gave us a word for the new year, unity, community, and kingdom advancement. And, you know, when God first gave us that word, you know, we all had a lot of ideas of what it meant. You know, unity, we thought God meant unity, us coming together, us being unified, amen? And we found out that it meant unity around the word of God. In other words, being all in agreement around the word of God. God did something this morning with the leadership through my wife that we're, now we're moving to unity around prayer. Everything this year is going to be unity around us, but unity around the word, right? And we walked through the Bible and we looked at that. We looked in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Go there real quick. Because if I keep talking, I'll never get to my message. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited, man. God is good. I don't know about some of y'all, but God is good. You know, I was outside. I, I, I got to, can, can, I, can I get on y'all a little bit? I was in the office watching, you know, and I, I think Lakeisha did the intro. He said, give God some praise. And you hear three people. You, it, that's a shame. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. That's how it needs to sound, man. Let me tell y'all something. I tell y'all this all the time. And y'all need to get a revelation of this. You need to get a revelation of this. I can walk in any football stadium in America today, anyone, and you tell me who the home team is, you can blindfold me. And within five minutes, I'll tell you who's winning the football game. Say it with me. Victory has a sound. Victory has a look. Victory has a walk. We got to get a revelation of that. We got to get a revelation. Some of y'all need to start walking a little different. Some of y'all need to start talking a little different. Amen. Say it with me. My words create my world. My words create my faith. My words create my heart. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart. And renew in me, Lord, a right spirit. The spirit of a warrior. Amen. God, us some praise. I keep telling y'all, man, we are from our lineage in this ministry. We're from the tribe of Benjamin. We are warriors, man. We're not the ordinary church. That's why everybody can't come here. This is special forces, man. Amen. This is the Rangers. This is the Seals. We're warriors, man. We've been called to take the battle to the enemy. I don't care what it is. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says this. He says, now I beseech you, brethren, that by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you speak the same thing and that there is no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So Paul's telling us we got to come together, not around black, white, Puerto Rican, Italian, you know, you know, whatever all the, the, how the world comes around. 
You know, you go in the hood, everybody's in their hood. That's not what God's talking about. God's talking about us coming together around the word. Doesn't matter what we look like. Doesn't matter what hood we came from. Doesn't matter what language we speak. We all speak God's language. The language, say it with me, the language of faith. faith. We're faith believers. We're faith people. That's what we are. We don't have to see it to believe it. We say it, then we believe it, then we receive it. Let me say it again. We say it, our saying it creates us believing it, and our believing it allows us to obtain victory. Well, Pastor, that that sounds like a, a, no, 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 no. The Bible says in the word of God, say unto the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. Believe in your heart. Watch this. Watch this. And don't doubt. It doesn't say don't doubt God. It says don't doubt what? Those things which you have said, and then you will have what? Whatsoever you say. I believe if you're not willing to say it, you really don't want it. Right. Amen. 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 If you ain't willing to say you're the best in the world, you don't really want to be the That's best it. in the world. That's it. I was watching a documentary. I, I watch documentaries and I study greatness. Because I'm in pursuit of greatness. My greatness, I'm in pursuit of is greatness for God. But I was watching a story on Tiger Woods. And his dad, from a very young age, painted on the canvas of his imagination. Write it down. You're only motivated to become what you can imagine yourself to be. Imagine is a vivid description of something specific. What do you believe in God for? Tiger Woods' dad painted on his on his heart that he was going to be the savior of the world. He was going to bring the races of the world together through golf. He was going to be the greatest golfer to ever walk the earth. How many of y'all know that vision is coming to pass? And he said it. He spoke it. And he spoke it. And he spoke it. And Tiger believed him. Tiger believed him. Your words, what you think, what you believe, have power. You know, I tell you all the time, Joey's favorite movie is Rocky. You know, when you think about the movie, the first Rocky movie, all y'all watch Rocky? At the very end, when he's getting ready to fight Apollo, he started to, he started to think about the natural. Apollo's never been beat. Apollo's never been knocked down. He's walking around. He's thinking about all these things. Say so he's looking at the facts. He moved away from his faith. See, that's, what, that's, that's what flesh versus faith does. Flesh looks at the facts. But then he got into bed with his woman. Say, when a man finds a wife, she find, he finds a good thing. And he started to talk to Adrian. He said, Adrian, who, who, am, I, who am I kidding? Nobody's ever even went the distance with Creed. That's what he said. But then he readjusted his vision. And he said, but if I can just go the distance with Apollo, I'll know for the first time in my life, I wasn't just another lucky bum from the docks. He readjusted. And when you watch the movie, he was always, when he got knocked down, grabbing for the rope just to get back to his feet. Now he didn't get it the first time, but the second time they fought. Now he knew because of what happened in the first time. So what we're going to talk about today is Joseph went through a process of preparation. And what you got to learn in life is even when you lose as a Christian, maybe you lose the battle, but we always win the war because we never lose. We either win or we what? We learn. Are you a learner? There's nothing wrong with making mistakes as long as you learn from them. Because when you learn from a mistake, 
or from a loss, you go from the loss being your master to you mastering the loss. Think about that. When you lose in that loss, whatever you lost in life, some people didn't have a father growing up, and they've allowed that to master them, and they're on drugs, and they, they can't get their life together because they've allowed that loss. Some were molested. Some were taken advantage of. Some were talked down to. All the things you hear people talk about. All the, don't get mad at pastor. All the excuses that people use. Well, they're not really excuses because those things are dominating those people's lives. So what you got to do is learn how to confront that thing. Like Joseph, we're going to talk about it. And then allow the mistakes or allow the things, whatever it was, learn to master. Now you become the master over it. Do what you fear most and you control fear. I'm not judged by the number of times I fail, but by the number of times I succeed. And the number of times I succeed is in direct proportion to the number of times I can fail and keep trying. Say, I will not quit. Therefore, I cannot, I will not ever be defeated. Amen. Listen, all warfare starts right here in your mind. And you got to push your mind down to your spirit. And then you got to allow your spirit man to come out. So we see God wants us unified around the word. That's what he wants to do. Now, today we're going to look at community. Before we do, I want to read this to you. This is the prophetic word that God gave me in the beginning of the year for the church. I read it to the church, but I want to point out one thing in this today. I may not read it all, but I'm going to read some of it. He said to me, my people, this is what God said, my people, return your eyes and return your ears and turn your hearts back to me, back to my word and back to my spirit. He said in 2021, I will exalt, I will lift, I will elevate and illuminate my light on those who turn their conversations and their focus from the world to my kingdom. He said, rise, shine to a new light. My glory and my spirit are on you and with you. My glory and my spirit are on you and they are with you. He said, here's what God said, stray away from foolish and worthless conversations and people. Watch, watch. Yes, I love them too, but I need you focused and not distracted in this season. Watch what he says. For it is a season of of clarity and power of my spirit working through you. Just lead those people to the brook I led you to and let the prophet through my spirit heal them. Their eyes also will become open. I am restoring honor and power to my prophets and to the house of the Lord and the assembly of God's people. He said, my light, my power will open blind, the blinded eyes of this world. He said, there is, never has been, and never will be a name greater than the name of my son, Jesus. He is your savior. He is your deliverer. He is your power. He is your healer. He is your prosperity. He is your confidence. And he is your identity. God said, own it. He said, receive it and walk in it. He says, my kids, my children don't need anything the world has. You never have and you never will. You are being prepared to lead a people, not follow them. He said, fear not, for I am the Lord. My word never fails, no matter what it looks like, no matter what it sounds like, or no matter how you feel or think it is. My word received by faith always comes to pass. This is the year. 
In the years to come, you will see my supernatural power working in your lives like never before. You will know it can only be my spirit, the spirit of the living God, doing what you are doing. Shining like you are shining. Overcoming like you are overcoming. My super on your natural. He says, come back and trust. Come back and serve your God. We are moving forward and there is no retreat in us. There is no going back. You think you think people have been surprised this year? He's talking about the COVID year. Wait until you see the look on their faces when your light is full and beaming on them. And their eyes become wide open as they see the power of the kingdom on you and in you. He says, go now. Get your life centered. Get your life rooted. And unified once and for all around my word. The power your community will see on you will draw them to me. We are assembling for the advancement of the kingdom. The kingdom is within you. The victory is within you. And the healing power is with you. Within you, saith the Lord. Amen. Amen. Give God some praise. That's what God said. That's what God said to us in the beginning of the year. Okay, so we see that this year and what we're doing is all around unity, getting unified around his word, community, allowing his word to grow in us and resonate through us so that the people that we're around will be, people don't need to hear you preaching. People don't need to read your Bible. Leave your Bible at home. Your life is the only Bible that people need to read. They need to see you honoring God. They need to see you putting God first. They need to see you operating by faith. Amen? Amen. So what we're going to learn today as we look now, we step into community relative to Joseph. I want to show you all some things. Because Joseph or because God was top priority in Joseph's life, God used Joseph to develop everybody around him. God used, a lot of people want to be leaders but they don't first want to be developed. A lot of people want to be leaders, but they don't want to first be developed. You can only develop something to the, to the degree in which you've been developed. You can only develop something to the, to the degree in which you've been developed. Oh, look at that. See? Ain't God good? Praise God. Um, you can only be developed to the degree in which you have been developed. You can only develop somebody. If you don't know how to walk or didn't learn how to walk, you can't teach somebody to walk. The only, listen to me, folks. Listen to me. The only thing one poor man can do for another poor man is feel sorry for. You don't need to take financial advice from a broke person. Amen? You don't need to take financial advice from a broke person. If a person is living week to week or month to month, or even year to year, you probably don't need to take financial advice from them. And another thing, you don't need to take financial advice from phony people. They look like they got somebody. Just because somebody drives a Cadillac don't mean they got money. <laughs> it means they got credit. There's a difference in money and credit. Now, they drive a you know $130,000 Range Rover and they got the title to it. That's a whole different story. Right? You can't, you can't go to somebody to try, for them to try to help you understand how to raise your children. They've never raised children. Are y'all with me? Yes, sir. So we see this in Joseph's life. Joseph brought people together everywhere he went. Joseph was a leader. Now, I want to go through these things with you today. So turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. So the first thing we see in Genesis 37 is Joseph was sold into slavery, Right? Doesn't sound too good, does it? We got some people are, 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 are paralyzed a day in life because people, they know that we're in slavery 100 years ago and they want to live in their slavery. They want to they they cripple their lives because their people were enslaved 100 years ago. My family was broke 100 years ago. I'm rich. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. 
I'm, I'm not going to stay broke because my family was broke 100 years ago. I'm moving on and upward. Say upward, upward. And, onward. and onward. Amen. Amen. Now you can sit there and talk about the past and let the past cripple you and, and, and all that all you want, but not in this church. We're moving forward. Why? Because the apostle Paul said, any man who puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Amen. See, now, you know, your religious scholars would have taught you that meant, you know, if you go slide, backslide. How many of y'all heard about backslide? Ain't no such thing as backslide. Either you're front sliding or you're backsliding. Ain't no back. You ain't saved and backslide. Sin don't determine whether you're saved or not. Your confession of faith determines whether you're saved or not. God already knows you're a sinner. He created you. He knows all about you. He knows what you're doing in the booth in the back in the corner in the dark. Why you say that, Pastor? Because he knows what I'm doing in the booth in the back in the corner in the dark. And I know I'm doing some stuff in the booth in the back in the corner in the dark that I need to fix. So I know you're doing some stuff in the booth in the back in the corner in the dark you need to fix. Yes, but see, when you got a preacher that thinks he ain't in the booth and ain't in the back and ain't in the dark, that's why we have the problem we have in church. Because they, they want you to think they're in the light. And they further in the booth than you are. And you coming to them to get out of the booth. <laughs> Amen. I know what I was. I know what I am. And I know what God is creating me to be. Amen. Amen. And, I'm not, and I'm not ashamed of any of it. Amen. Because I didn't deliver me. The blood of Jesus delivered me. And if I couldn't deliver me and the blood delivered me, how am I going to keep me delivered? I can't keep nothing. Man, I can't keep this weight off me. How long have I been talking about this six-pack I got? Look at that six-pack. Ooh, baby. Calling it by faith. God, hey, look, if Jesus could turn water into wine, he could turn one into six. Amen. But how many of y'all know, just like I know God can turn this one pack into a six pack. I have to be sensitive every morning when the Holy Spirit says, get up and walk. Amen. And I choose to lay down. Amen. See, that's, see, that's what the church don't want to tell you about. Amen. God still loves me. I'm still saved. But I just, might just end up in heaven with a one pack. Amen. Y'all remember to tell Pastor Franny, can't the, uh, what's the guy called that when you die, he fixes you up? What's that guy called? You know when you're mortician. Yeah. Liz, you tell Pastor Franny, something happens to me before we talk to her, I want the mortician to put a six-pack on. <laughs> I want them to put me in there with, with some shorts on and a six-pack. <laughs> uh, they can do it. All right. <laughs> Mr. Emerson said, we can do it, Pastor. <laughs> so in Genesis chapter 37, in Genesis chapter 37, let's look at these today real quick. Man, I only got 20 minutes left. I thought I was in the first 15 minutes, Jeremiah. No, I done blew past that one? All right. Genesis chapter, see why I told you I can't worry about that clock? Hey, Amen. Genesis chapter 37. In verse 27, so we see that, that Joseph was sold into slavery, right? But what did he do? He didn't sulk about it. He didn't complain about it. He developed confidence and organizational skills in the palace. Genesis 37, verse 27. Look what it says. He says, come and let us sell him into, how do you say that? Yeah, I call it Ishmaelites. And let, look at this. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and, he, and, and his brethren were content. So we see here in Genesis 37, 27, not only was this man sold into slavery, but his own brothers sold him into slavery. Think about that for a minute. That's a good reason to get there and be mad, right? But he wasn't mad. Amen. 
He went into the palace and he started learning organizational skills. He started to educate himself in Genesis 39. Go to Genesis 39. We see that in Genesis 39, he was framed for, an, for adultery. Now, the reason why I'm going over these today is because 90% of the people I talk to have an excuse. Right? Y'all ever talk to any of them? They always got an excuse. There's always a why. Why they're late. Why they missed the payment. Why they didn't come to work. Why they didn't do the project. Right? There, there's always, right? Always a why. Watch what happens here. In Genesis, so you need to read all Genesis 39, but in Genesis 39 and 20, Genesis 39 and 20, it says, and Joseph's master, now, now you got to understand, Joseph was a handsome, the Bible says he was a handsome young man. He looked like Pastor Nick. <laughs> oh, oh, he was, he was. And Potiphar's wife came on to him. And Potiphar, Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, she was hot. She looked good too. But Joseph honored God more than he did hotness. Amen. See, some of y'all can't handle it. The minute a pretty woman just bats her eyes at you, you melt. You got no discipline. Joseph had discipline. Amen? Amen. Joseph had discipline. You got to learn to have discipline. You, you, you got to, you, you have to, you have to honor God. You can't lead people on. You can't play around. You can't dance on the fence. Who owns the fence? The devil owns the fence. And a girl messaged me yesterday on Facebook. Hey, how, how are you? Who are you and how do I know you? Well, you don't really know me. I, I just, well, well, let me explain something to you. First of all, I'm married, happily married, 36 years. Uh, yeah, yeah, ha happily. So you say happily. I'm a pastor. I'm a man of God, and I honor God. Now, if there's something I can do to help you or you need help, let me know, and I will connect you with my wife. And then she proceeds to continue. So now I got to go there. I don't know where pastor had to go. <laughs> as long as you act like a hoe, right? That's what pastor told her. You're going to be treated like a, right? That's just what, I, I, I'm not going to say promiscuous. I'm not going to use those words. I had to tell her. Right? See, some of y'all want to tap dance all around it, and then y'all get drug into these, these traps and you, you can't even keep your phone because your wife can't trust you. Because you, well, you know, you, well, I was just trying to help her. You don't even know her. <laughs> and if a woman contacts you and she needs help, you need to turn, what does pastor tell you to do? Give her to your, well, run and give her to your wife. <laughs> Who said run? Yeah. That, that's only if you're married, Isaiah. You ain't, you ain't got to run now. You can rap a little bit. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's, he's got the marriage manual down, Harry. Run. So, so jo Joseph was a handsome man. Potiphar's wife was, a, was an attractive woman. But, but Joseph honored God. Joseph loved God. Everybody around Joseph knew that Joseph loved and honored God. Does everybody around you outside the church know that you love and honor God? See, some of you can't invite people to church because you don't want them to come to church because they know you outside the church. <laughs> you worried about, you know, man, they come to church, man. They may, you know, they may peep my whole card. They may, they, they may tell the church what I'm really like. We should want to live a life I'm not talking about being sin conscious. Well, you know, I did this sin. Now, God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about not being sin conscious. I'm talking about being righteousness conscious. Live your life right because it's the right thing to do. I've had to tailor back on Sunday afternoons my buccaneer commentary. 
Because Pastor Nick gets kind of hot. And people be looking at me like, man, he is serious about this. I want to go down to one Buccaneer place and just pull Byron Leftwich up and give him a beat down. Amen? But, I, but, you know, the Holy Spirit jacked me up. Said, man, you can't, you can't be going after him like that on social media. You have a higher call. So now I just call David up and complain to David. <laughs> da David's like my confessional. <laughs> Amen. I call, I call David. David, I can't handle this, man. <laughs> David's like, go pray in the spirit, pastor. <laughs> Genesis chapter 39 and verse 20. It says, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in prison. You all see that? So this young man, the, 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 the man's wife is coming on to him. And instead of doing the wrong thing with his wife, he respects the man and respects God enough to not do it and still ends up in prison. How I many of y'all know that's a, that's a good place to get offended with God? That's a good place. You're serving God. You're believing God. You're giving. You're, you're coming to church. You're serving in the church. You're sowing your tithe. You're believing God. You're trying to restrain from evil. And now you get pulled over. And never did any drugs in your life. And all of a sudden, the cop drops something on you. And by the way, folks, 99% of people that say they're innocent are guilty. Just so you know. I was one of those. I was always innocent and always guilty. Amen? But anyway, the cop, let's say you legitimately didn't do nothing wrong. And the cop just doesn't like you, so he plants something on you. And now you go to jail. Now you just give up on God. How did God let this happen to me? But Joseph didn't do that. Jo Joseph used jail to, to, he used his ability to, to discern dreams and solve problems. Joseph literally went and discerned a dream that got him out of jail. Jo Joseph used what God put in him to better his community around him. But why was his community impacted by what he did? Because they saw God working through him. I mean, they literally were saying it, Pharaoh, and they were literally saying this, everything Joseph does prospers. God's favor is on Joseph. Are y'all with me? We see that in uh, Genesis chapter 42, or Genesis chapter 41, it says they endured seven years of famine. And in those seven years of famine, Joseph prepared to save his country and bring Pharaoh to great wealth. How many times with y'all right here in this church has pastor taught you, save 10%, tithe 10%, and learn to live off the rest, and you'll ne what? You'll never what? You'll never be broke another day in your life. You have to save money. You have to invest your money. Stop trying to, to figure out how to make, listen, it's about OPM, other people's money. You don't go buy the Gucci belt with your money. You go buy the Gucci belt when you invest money and that investment makes you money to go buy the Gucci belt. Are, are you understanding? I didn't buy these shoes with my money. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I bought these shoes with people where I invested in other companies and their companies and their investment made me money. Amen. And then I went and bought the shoes. Amen. I had patience. I could wait. I didn't have to have them. See, things, the, the only time things become sin is when things have you and you don't have things. Say, failing to plan, failing to plan. is planning to fail. Planning to fail. The world has a plan for your money. Amen. The cable company has a plan for your money. Everybody around you has a plan for your money. I remember I used to train with John the Beast Mugabe, fought Marvin Hagler for the middleweight championship of the world from Kampala, Uganda. 
was 34-0 with 34 knockouts, I believe, was his record when he fought Hagler. And they played all kind of games so that Hagler could beat him because Hagler couldn't beat him. They got the fight, and then Hagler got hurt two weeks before the fight because they knew Mugabe couldn't stay in shape because he didn't have good discipline. So they knew if they postponed the fight, then he'd get out of shape, and then, and then Hagler would have a chance. And I remember, I, I used to go around, he couldn't count money. So I used to send him with me to the store. We'd go, I'd go buy him clothes, and he, he, he'd, come up, he'd come up to the counter to pay his bill, and he, he just, this is how he'd pay his bill. The guy says $238. He'd reach in his pocket, just put out. Couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't count money. And I remember when he fought the title fight, and he got his first big payday. Mickey Duff and George France, they all sat him down, the promoters and the trainer, and they got out the book. How many of y'all ever seen a movie with, about Tupac? Yes, sir. Yeah. What's it called? His latest movie he made? All Eyes on Me. How many of y'all seen that? Yeah, y'all need to go watch it. Especially for all of y'all that think the white man's trying to get your money. Y'all need to go watch that movie and you need to watch the movie of, of Mike Tyson's life. Amen. When Tupac got out of jail, he thought all his homies were doing everything for him. And when he wanted to go out and do his own thing, Suge Knight opened up the book. But remember this? Remember this? Remember? And then, you know, he had a million dollars coming. By the time they got done with him, he not only didn't have the million he had, he still owed two million. He was in slavery because of his ignorance. Amen. Don't ever be ignorant. Amen. Know where you're at. Know where you're going. Know where God is taking you. Joseph believed and trusted God. God was his source, not man, not Pharaoh. God was Joseph's source. We need to understand that in our lives, and this is what I wanted to get to you today, there is stages, there's levels, stages, and seasons. Here's the wisdom to everything that you do. Listen, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, I mean chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Turn there. It's in the Old Testament. I just want to just read the very beginning. But I want you to read the whole thing. I read this during weddings sometimes. Ecclesiastics. It's by Proverbs. Yep. Chapter 3. You got to slow down a little bit. Let pal, you can't get there before me. Ecclesiastics chapter 3. Now you can read the whole thing, but let me just read the beginning. It says, to everything there is a season. And a time, and to every purpose under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die. Why do people freak out when it's time to die? You know, people call me, Beth, you, so and so just died in my family. Oh, okay, you, oh, oh, how old were they? They were 172. <laughs> oh, okay, did you? Did you expect them to live to 173? In, in, in other words, we are going to miss people when they go. But as born-again believers, man, it should not. I've seen death destroy people. It should not destroy us. We're going to grieve. We're going to be hurt. We met Miss Carolyn just lost her daddy. But how old was he? A hot 102. And that ain't a temperature. He was 102, and the day before he died, he still got out of bed and got on his knees and prayed to God. Amen. 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 Now, is Miss Carolyn going to miss her daddy? Yes. Should she miss it? Yes, she was a good daughter. Of course she is. But she ain't going to be all, all, you know, six months from now, her sniffling and crying and carrying on. Amen. I know people that go into Great Depression over losing people. There's a, it says it right here in the Bible, there's a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which has been planted. So we see there are seasons to life. In the, in, in today when we receive the offering, Lakeisha read out of Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Look what God told me today. When, when, when she, watch this. It says in Luke 38, it says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will men give into your bosom. This is literally God teaching us how we prosper. Give. What does the government say? If you're in need, what does the government say? Put your, put your hand out. 
Ask somebody to help you. No. God says give. Amen. You want to know why you can never have none? Because you don't have a giving heart. Amen. God doesn't need to give. God doesn't need to get anything to somebody that's going to keep it all for themselves. God made me rich because he could trust me with his money. If God gave me a million dollars and said I need 500,000 of it, he knows I would give it to him. If God gave me 100,000 and maybe that year I only need to give him 20,000, whatever it is, when I get paid, I don't ask God about a tithe. I ask God, how much would you want me to give? And I don't worry about it because I know I got good seed and good ground. Because God is my source. I don't live off my business. I definitely don't live off the church because all y'all together couldn't pay me. <laughs> we could take the whole income of the church and it can't pay me. I'm just telling you. That's just, you can laugh, do whatever you want. <laughs> that's how it is. That's why I don't need to take nothing. Amen. So the point is, is that why, why would God do that? Because God can trust me. God, God knows if he tells me to give something, I'm going to give it. And why am I going to give it? Because I know if I'm obedient to God and I give, more is coming. Yes, sir. Amen. Why? Because he is my source. My living comes from my sowing, not from my working. Amen. My harvest is in direct proportion to the seed I sow, not how many hours I put in at work. Amen. Watch what God, God said to me when I, when I read that scripture. He said, stop asking and telling me what you want and start asking what you can give, what you can give. Same thing is stop telling God what he can do for you and start asking God what you can do for his kingdom. Amen. Why? The, the first principle of God is what? Give. Give. God wanted a family. What did he do? He gave his son. Why is it? This, these are hard things for the world to get, for the world to understand. Why? Because we're selfish people. That make you a bad person. I, 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 was, I was saying something to my wife yesterday. You know, if the only time, I'm going to mess some marriages up right here. If the, I, I'm just going to say this. If the only time your spouse is happy with you when you're doing everything they want you to do, they probably don't love you. Oh, the only time he's got a big smile on his face is when his wife is swinging from the chandeliers <laughs> or she's cleaning the house or she's doing it. Or the only time the wife it got to, has a smile on her face is when they're walking in the Millennium Mall and he's buying her the jeans she wants and he's buying her the watch. No, that's not love. That's not love. You know why Pastor Frank get anything she wants? Because for 15 years, she loved me regardless of me. Amen. Amen. Pastor Frankie, she makes me so mad about money. Can, 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 stop. What do you mean? Matter of fact, when I get home today, I'm not going to tell you. Something I'm going to do when I get home today. I, I, I've just made a decision. It, it's just how it has to be. Because she just keeps asking me. I mean, I keep money in my pocket. So she don't keep money in her pocket. But Brenda, that's her fault. We got a bank account. We got a safe with thousands. We got a lot of cash. She could just go in the safe and get one of them, them stacks. Yeah. Amen. And it's, 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 just, it's just weird to me, Amory. She's always asking me for my money. Now, I mean, not that it's my money. My money is her money, but just go get your own money. I mean, go, go, go get what you want. We had a little conversation about that last night. So today when I get home, I'm going to go in and save myself. I guess I'm just going to put it on her dresser here. And there's eight more of them in there. When you want one, go get another one. Leave me alone, man. My little $22.50. <laughs> How many of y'all ever went through the drive-thru? <laughs> honey, honey, would you like any french fries? No. Uh, honey, honey, I'm at the window. 
I'm at the window. Do you want any French fries? I don't want none, honey. Okay. The minute the fries go to, and I put it in the middle of the console. She says, the, the bag's kind of warm. She gets one fry. Oh, these fries are hot. They're fresh. I get so mad. Those are my French fries. I can buy you 50 orders of French fries. All right. The first season, listen, write, write this down, and we're going we're to finish. Y'all all right? It's okay for us to have a little fun in church, right? All right, everybody wants to keep church all serious, man. I, listen, I'm serious about the things of God, but I want us to enjoy the journey. We're here to enjoy life. God wants us, the Bible says God wants us to have and enjoy life, have and enjoy it to the full till it overflows. That's what he says, amen? amen. Write this down, the first season. So we're talking about these seasons, right? These seasons. The first season is we don't know what we don't know. There's a time in your life you just don't know. You just don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And say, that's okay. Say, it's okay not to know. It's not okay to stay not knowing. Ignorance is okay for a season. But then you got to develop. When I worked with John many years ago, I couldn't write real well. So John helped me out with my writing. And how many of y'all know, I didn't just piggyback off of John and just be lazy and, and plagiarize his work. I took his work with his permission, so it wasn't plagiarizing. And from that, I utilized it to help me become more successful. But then I took those things and I read them and I understood them. I went to John and we'd be at lunch and I'd, hey, John, why do you do, why do you start your sentence out this way? Why do you, and he, he worked with me and he explained it to me, right? And I learned. And I'm not ashamed to stand up here and tell y'all. I didn't write real well. I didn't write in a, you know, I was a bookie. <laughs> I didn't know how to write. My pastor told me I had to go get a job. So I went to get a job. So I had to learn things. But what made me different was I wasn't, I, I, what you think don't matter to me. Amen. Right, John? And I never cared what anybody thought because I was always beating them. What do I care what somebody looks like when I'm beating them? I'm number one. Yeah, I can't do that, but you can't do what I do. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I used to tell people this way. I'm fat, but you're ugly, and I can lose weight. <laughs> I look good. Hallelujah. Can't lose ugly. <laughs> I was going to use the word Jerry. Jerry used to use for a dog, but then I remembered I can't. I can't say that word. And I never thought it was a bad word. I thought it was kind of cool. But I'm going to leave that. Jerry came up to me and went, hey, Pastor, you know, you really can't be saying that, church, that word from the, from the pulpit. I, I didn't know it was a bad word, but Jerry had me cussing up here. Well, I can't put it all on Jerry. Jerry and Domingo. The second season... <laughs> The second, the second season. Well, Domingo let me do it. Jerry hit me to it. At least Jerry didn't want her pastor up here looking bad. The second season is we know what we don't know. So then we come to a season of life like I was in that season where I knew I didn't know how to write. I knew that now, right? But there was a time when I was writing their T-H-E-I-R and their T-H-E-E-R-E. -E, and isn't there another there? Then they are. See, I didn't know anything about all those things. I just put there. And then, and then I had people, hey, hey, you know, that's not the proper, right? So now you know, so now you got to do better. The third season is we know and we grow and it starts to show. The third season is we know and we grow and it starts to show. Amen? Amen. And then the last season of life is we simply go because of what we know. We simply go because of what we know. 
And I like to attribute all this that I'm talking about to sports training. That's why you train yourself and you develop what's called muscle memory. We have to develop faith memory. We have to develop faith muscle. And the way we develop faith muscle and faith memory is we begin to get and encamp ourselves around the Word of God. Amen? Y'all all right? Here's what I want to leave y'all with today. And we'll close right here. The fourth one is we simply go because of what we know. That's where you're at. See, you're, in that, you're in that season where you, you, you've been through it. So you know. You know what you know. Now you know how to go. And you just go. You go do what God's called you to do. This is what I want to leave you with today. God's only desire. God has one desire for you. And that is to be the only source in your life of hope. The only source in your life of confidence. And the only source in your life of expectation. When, when our hope and when our confidence and when our expectation is in God, our faith will take us to places we could never think, ask, or imagine. Let me say it one more time. God's only desire is that your hope, that your confidence and that your expectation is in him. When your hope, when your confidence, and when your expectation is in God, your faith will take you to places you could never think, ask, or imagine. When you transcend and transform from becoming a Christian, or a believer to becoming the word of God. The walking, I am the walking word of God. When I walk in places, things change. When I'm around people, they increase. Anybody that spends 30 minutes sitting down talking to me is going to be better when they get done than when they start. Why? Because the wisdom of God is in my life. Amen. Amen. The wisdom of God. God, when the word of God begins to permeate in you, his wisdom will begin to flow out of you and answers will come like never before. God will bring people into your path and he will put you right there just to help them up. Just to help. And listen to me. If you want to be like the world when you help somebody up, you know what the world does when they help somebody up? They expect something. You don't expect nothing from nobody. You expect what you expect from God. Amen. Say, my reward, my reward is in God, in God. Not, in people. not in people. You understand me? When you help somebody up, you help them up because somebody helped you up. I help people up because somebody helped me up. I help people up because somebody prayed for me. I help people up because somebody gave. So when it was time for me to come to church, there was a chair there waiting. I help people up because when I needed a man of God to help me up, somebody was there before me encouraging him and building him and God developing him to be everything I needed him to be for me. No, 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 listen. What did I tell you the other day? You cannot lead people if you need people. Listen to me. You cannot lead people. I told my leadership today, go home and figure out how you can run your ministry all by yourself. Because in 2021, we are going to uphold the standards of this church. Our people are going to sit down and get the word till they're ready to uphold, receive, and walk in the standards of what God has called us to do. Amen. Amen. We ain't doing things any kind of way here. We are going to do what God's called us to do, and we are going to do it in excellence in the world. Let me tell y'all something. How many of y'all were here when we first got here? Who was here when we first got here? John and Brenda, Miss Carolyn. What, this, what, what did this area look like when we first got here? It was a freaking dump. It literally was a dump back there. You 
remember that, Jerry? You were here when we got here. No, no, you were at the first church. You got married here. Oh, okay. Well, this place was a dump. I mean, it was a dump. I mean, I mean, the whole, there were gangs hanging on the corner. They, they were selling drugs right there. Look at it now. Go drive. It's clean. They pick up. Why? Because we pick up. And pastor will go over there and tell them. Why ain't the gangs here no more? Why ain't the drug dealer? Because you ain't got a punk pastor. Amen. 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 No, you got look. You go do what you want to shoot your arms up. You go do whatever you want. If you want deliverance, it's here. But you ain't gonna do that here. Amen. Then you go figure out whatever you want to do. Just know God ain't happy with it. And I ain't talking about me. It ain't by my power, by my might. The Holy Spirit. And man, we start walking. I start walking around this thing, praying in the Holy Spirit. Them drug dealers didn't know what to do with that. Oh, oh, oh. We better get on. We better go. Then one of the drug dealers looked up my name. He said, I looked you up on Google. Well, I know who you are. You're a gangster pastor. I said, no, you ain't got to worry about me being a gangster. You got to worry about me being a pastor. Because I'm not a gangster no more. On those terms, on those terms, you, you beat me. Because I'm not going to fight you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you so much. You're either, either I'm going to draw you or drive you. Amen. 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 I'll never forget the day John was, you know, John, John wasn't very much of a, John ain't the kind of guy that's just going to pray with you. John, John, was a, John was a born again and raised Catholic. So to them, they come to church and cross themselves and do the knee dip and they're gone. That's their right their extent of God and, and all that. And John was in the back one day, man, and he walked around the dumpster. And we said the dumpster in the back, and the guy was back there shooting up. And the guy was like, what do you call it, having a, yeah. And he lifted up his arm to John, and he said, pray with me. And John Ferrandes, and I would have never thought this. I've been around John a long time. John grabbed his hand and began to pray with him. That, that in itself was a miracle. Cause that, because that's not who John is. John would have came and got pastor. Pastor! <laughs> if somebody out here needs your prayer. So John began to pray for him, and then John helped him up, and he said, you need to come in church. I'll never forget this. And he sat him right down in the back row. And one of my ushers came up to me and said, I got to see you right now, pastor. I said, I'm, I'm getting ready to Go a minute. No, no, I need to see you right now. Now, y'all know I normally don't react real well to that, but for some reason, say the Holy Spirit, I decided to go in the back and hear what this gentleman had to say. Do you know that John brought a guy in the church and sat him down that's high? He's got track marks on his arm. He's probably been shooting up heroin. His eyes are... And I looked at him, and I said, let me ask you a question. What would have you had John do with him? Well, I don't know, but he can't come into church. I said, I'm not going to say his name. I'm going to say John was his name. I said, John, let me tell you something. If somebody that just got done shooting up that's high reaches out for prayer and comes in the church, if we can't invite that person into the church, we're going to shut this down today because we're phonies. We have to love people. And we, have, we can't love people where we want them to be. We have to love people where they are and allow God to create them into what he wants them to be. We are not and will never be a religious church. Not as long as God has me being the under shepherd of this house. We're going to love people. We're going to walk in the word. We're not going to be phony. We're going to be real. And we're going to move forward every day. Amen. Y'all get anything out of the word? Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Bow your heads. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Father, for your word. 
I thank you, Lord, for your word being alive, being active, and living on the inside of each person that's here today. I thank you, Lord, just, Father, that this word on seasons, particularly, Father God, for them to be content where they are and press forward to where they're going, will just resonate in their spirit. Lord, you love them. Lord, it is your desire to see your word come to pass in their heart. Lord, it is your desire to see all they're believing for come to pass in their lives. Lord, let them know that you love them just as they are. Let them know that your love is unconditional. Let them know that your love is unmovable. And let them know that your love is unshakable. Let them know today, Lord, that they can stop running from their past because you love them right where they're at. Hallelujah. It's in Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen.